PB Kirkland, what's good? Everything all right. You know me, keeping it, <laughs> keeping it going. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming in. No problem. My son confirmed so, everything. He said that's something you should do. Yeah, man. That's right. So, where exactly did you grow up? In Harlem, New York. Actually, Harlem okay. Hospital. All right. And at what point in your life did you start getting into basketball, seriously? Probably uh, nine years old. Okay. And at nine years old, did you see that you were, you know, had an aptitude for it more than like the kids around you? Well, yes, IQ. You know, it's like either you have it or you don't have it. And you don't recognize it, which I did. Other people did. People kept telling me, wow, look how he handled the ball. Wow, look at this. Look at how hockey. He shouldn't be able to do that at his age. And I would just absorb the things they were saying. And then it ultimately, it kept progressing, progressing, progressing. And as the year went by, it was confirmed because then I was able to play when I was like 12 years old. I was able to play with the guys 15 to 16. When I was 18 years old in high school, I, yeah, in high school, I, uh, they think it's a new thing for a guy to leave high school and go pro. I remember getting most valuable player in a pro all-star game playing with Happy Harrison, who played with the Lakers, against Will Chamberlain, who was also the greatest big man in the history of basketball. And I got most valuable then. So that myth about a player being able to go from high school to pro it's just, in my time, the opportunity didn't exist. Absolutely. Years later, now, they had what's called a hardship draft. Then it existed. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, at n nine years old, you started playing. Mm -hmm. People already started talking about how great you were. Like, what do you think was sort of your first, um, you know, kind of big break in basketball that sort of put you in a different league than everybody else? You know, at that time. Yeah, my ability to score. I think when I was uh, 14 years old, yeah, I uh, broke a record in the community center. Dunleavy Milbeck, I think I scored 70 points. And the record still held the day. And that was it. Once that happened, then everybody was talking about you. The expectation sort of controls things after that. The hype, you know what I mean? So then everywhere I played after that, everybody was expecting me to score a lot of points. I remember when I was in... In high school, I saw my coach and he said, how's everything going? I said, I'm doing fine. He said, I heard you scored 16 points the last three games. I said, yeah. He said, what happened to you? I said, what do you mean what happened to you? He said, you broke the record in here when you was a kid. How could you be scoring 16 points? And then I went home and thought about it. I think the next game, I scored 57. I actually outscored the next game after that, scored 63. I outscored the whole other team. They didn't have but 50-something. I had 63 that game. So my average was from 16 points a game. I ended up uh, averaging 35 points a game when the year ended. But that's because I kind of felt embarrassed because he taught me how to play. You know, sometimes it takes somebody old enough to raise your consciousness in every level of life, whatever it is. And he just made me feel real silly about scoring 16 points a game. And that sort of was the advent of Pee Wee Kirkland being – a scoring machine, because when I played in, in Rucker in high school, I led Rucker High School in, co in scoring. When I played in college, I led the college division in scoring, straight up to when I played in Rucker Pro League. I'm the only person ever led Rucker Pro League in scoring in consecutive years, and that's when the pros was there, all the pros. That's when teams, some teams almost had, like the Knicks, they almost had their whole team, the Nets, they had like eight, nine players deep from the actual team. So I think in 1972, a lot of people did a lot of things, but it was, a lot, it was a little different because then that's when the pros stopped coming to Rucker. I think the NBA, they didn't want them to play at Rucker. They put something in their contract saying, if you get hurt in street basketball, we're not responsible. Our medical won't cover you. So pros continue to come, but not like they did then, you know. I, sure. wouldn't, I wouldn't know anyway because the year they stopped coming was the year I went on a federal vacation, so I was in prison. <laughs> so I wasn't there. But I know they had stopped coming. 
now, now, being the scoring machine that you were in high school, like how heavily recruited were you by, by colleges as you were getting ready to graduate? Well, I, don't, I wasn't really recruited by a lot of schools. I remember Long Island University wanted me to come. But one of the reasons I wasn't recruited, my coach hated me. Because after I stopped scoring 16 points a game and started averaging 35, we started winning. I guess I wasn't playing within his system. And he really, you know, I could through the grapevine hear some things he had said to other coaches, but I wasn't thinking about college anyway like that, you know, because I knew nobody could, I knew I was the best point guard in my mind on the planet Earth. So I didn't care about no colleges, you know. I, I probably went to Long Island University if that was the case. What I did was I went to a junior college where my friends in the neighborhood was, where my brother was, where the guys I knew was. And I wasn't thinking division one, two, or three. None of them things mattered to me. You know, like to do today, they controlled the game basketball. It didn't matter. You know, I went to a junior college, and I averaged Kittrell Junior College in, in uh, North Carolina, Henderson. AME school, and I led the nation in scoring with a 40, 41 point average. Then when okay. I left there, and I probably wouldn't have left, but what happened was the coach was trying to get me to stay three years. I said, no, man, I'm not failing my grades. It's junior college. After two years, I'm gone. He said, it's, it's a new rule now at the school. You can't get a scholarship. Only way you can get a scholarship is stay three years. I left that night. So caused me not to be there next year. Not only that, I redshirted when I went to Norfolk State. And Norfolk State basically was a small college. Actually, Norfolk State wasn't even a small college ranking. I, I, was, I had the choice to go there or Winston-Salem, either with Big Al's Gaines at Winston-Salem or Coach Fears at Norfolk State. You know, I kind of went to Norfolk, talked to the coach. And what was crazy is, Back then, you know, those were historical black colleges. They wasn't really accepted in mainstream society, but I didn't know that. You know, I just understood basketball and I knew I had a gift. So when I went to Norfolk, the coach told me they needed a passer. Yeah, I was kind of shocked, you know. Why would he want me? I'm the guy that just led the nation in school with a 41-point average. Why would you want me to be the passer? He said, we got some guys out of Virginia that could put the ball in the basket. And I said, okay. So I went along with it, played there, and the guys he was talking about was, you know, they could put the ball in the basket. From Richmond, Southern boys, Bob Dandridge was one, uh, Charles Bonaparte, Hookshot Grant, who I'd actually played against in junior college, those guys could put the ball in the basket. As a result, all he asked me was, could you get by two men? I said, I've been getting about two in all my life. You know what I mean? So he said, because he said he didn't want but one point guard on the floor at at a time. So Bob Danger was the guy I would kick the ball to, get the ball back from. Anytime I realized that the double team was trying to stay too tight, I just kick it to him and get the ball back. But we kind of reversed things that year. And that's what I'm saying about when people talk about how great they was. You know, you just got to go by what other people say and the things you did. Because things I've done in basketball, people talk about today in terms of transforming the game. Most of the things I see guys doing in the NBA, when people say, oh, wow, wow, and they show the highlights of things I did in the past. <laughs> and so I guess I was revolutionizing the game then because the game originally was based on pick and roll. In, in, in Norfolk State, we was fast-breaking. At the junior college, we was fast-breaking. We led the nation in scoring. The team led the nation in scoring. And it was the first year they had done that. It was also the first year UCLA didn't lead the nation in scoring. And UCLA, came, John Wooden sent scouts to me. You know, I walked in the gym, and the coach looked at me like he had tears in his eyes. I said, what's the matter? He said, two scouts from UCLA in, in my office, they want to talk to you. So I said, what about what? He said, you have to talk to them, which I thought was strange because he was the coach. And they told me they wanted me to leave. They said, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said, he was the best point guard he ever seen. We want you to leave and come to UCLA. And next year, you and Kareem will be bringing the ball down. You'll be bringing the ball down, but you and Kareem will be playing together for four years. Mm -hmm. 
y'all, you and him will get drafted one or two. We guarantee that. So, which was strange to me because remember I was at a junior college, and now I redshirted at Norfolk, set out a year, and this is another year, and that year I'm playing. So I said, well, I don't understand what you're saying about how, how can I be a freshman again? He said, we don't recognize this basketball, which meant they didn't recognize black college basketball at that particular time. So I said, it, which was strange to me, so I said, you know, I understand what you're saying. He said, oh, and all you do is you just start in September. I said, yeah, but I'm not going. He said, what do you mean not going? I said, I'm not leaving here. He said, you don't understand what we're saying to you. What we, and he repeated everything he said. I said, you don't understand what I'm saying to you. I'm not going. He said, you're not leaving here. This, you know, school wasn't even ranked at all to go to UCLA. But I didn't, be honest with you, like I said before, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know UCLA like that. You know what I mean? I wasn't into, I was into street basketball, but I wasn't into college basketball, and I never, I never watched college basketball. So, and if I had, it wouldn't have mattered because I would never have walked away from our team. You know, you play with guys, you learn to love guys. You know what I mean? I mean, Dandridge and them, the guys I played back then, we today, we're unbelievably close friends. You know what I mean? Is in that bond from the things we did together, will never, never die. You know, I was the first person that ever got drafted at Norfolk State in the pros and the ABA. And I made all conference, all tournament, small college All-American, all CIAA, got most valuable in the tournament. Every award you could win in four years, I won every award in one year. And remember, that I was the passer. But it just so happened when we got to the tournament, Danger filed out. And co coach, coach Pitts, assistant coach, said to the coach, the only way you're going to win this game is to let Kirkland shoot the ball. So the coach looked at me and said, is that right? I said, yep. You know what I mean? I've been wanting to shoot the ball all year because that's what I do, score, right? So then I ended up scoring mostly all the points. And all, actually, I was on the foul line with like 12 seconds to go, and we was down two. So I had to make both foul shots for it to go into overtime. Then I scored mostly all the points in all three overtimes till they took me out. I think we was up, I think, eight and nine. But we won the game, and, and I got most valuable. Ironically, every coach, all 11 coaches voted for me to get most valuable but my own coach. Because that would have been another record, you know. And I can understand, I respect where he did, what he did, because remember I was the pastor. Danger was actually the guy putting the ball in the basket, Charles Bonaparte. Those guys was the guys putting the ball in the basket. So I can understand his loyalty to them, but and it, you know, like I said, we we just went it, we all play all all further and you know, and then eventually they said that they wanted to play go back to playing the way we did. Instead of NCAA, they wanted to go back to regular. So I stopped shooting, we lost that game. Mm. But we, knew, you know, we played Ashland in Ohio. They was the best in, in best college at freezing the ball. We was the best at running the ball. And I was trying to tell the coach, not this game, just let me score, run the score up, and then they got to follow us. But he said he wanted to go back. We went back to what we did, and that was that. And we, and we lost that game. But the record was unbelievable. I mean, it, it, we ended up having tremendous articles in Sports Illustrated, and the school went to another level because they Division One school now. And the next year, could you imagine being unranked and the next year they played in Madison Square Garden? Mm. <laughs> Crazy. So all I'm saying is a lot of people talk basketball, but they've never really been through the fire because it's a big difference in saying I was a great basketball player in the park but you know, you have to be able to have that mindset and that IQ to be that in school, in college, collegiate basketball. You understand what I'm saying? Because them coaches will say, well, we want you, we want to run the system. We want to run slow. We want to run fast break. You know, we want to run open court. We want to we want motion offense. If you don't know what he's talking about, how are you going to do that? So sure. that's when you know that you was gifted. You know what I mean? Because I used to listen to the coaches that taught me how to play. 
you know, especially Roger Buster Bryant, my first coach. And it seemed like everybody else couldn't hear what he was saying. <laughs> and I was looking right in the coach's mouth. You know, so I, when it was time to get on the court, I learned real fast that a point guard is actually extension of the coach on the court. So I had to execute what the coach wanted to execute. Then I had to understand what it meant to, at the last seven seconds when the clock going down, now if the play ain't working, now I gotta be the other guy to turn it around, to create something and make something else happen. And a lot of guys don't understand that, you know. Basketball has changed a lot, but it has, it has advanced. But it, the fundamentals of basketball are not going anywhere, you know. Now, let, let's rewind for a second. You know, right around the time that you were getting into basketball, you know, a few years later, you started actually getting into the street life. Yeah, a few years later, yeah. Like, how old were you when you first started selling drugs? I never sold drugs. Never. never. What I did was, uh, I was involved with the life of crime. At, yeah, right about, not too far after I started playing basketball, maybe three or four years later. And when I say I never sold drugs, don't mean I was never involved with drugs. I just was somebody who, through other illegal means, you know, just robbing jewelry stores and things like that and making a lot of money from that just put me in a position to be able to finance what ultimately became a drug empire. But I never actually sold nobody no drugs. And <laughs> nobody could ever say they sold me anywhere where anybody was selling drugs. You know? hmm. you know, I mean, I got arrested for conspiracy. And I don't know why would I lie to you. Or, and everybody knows the truth, but you know, it is what it is. And I have no problem saying what I did and the fact that I was in the life. Uh, but no, I never sold no drugs. But again, the reality is they don't, and what you realize is it don't make no difference what position you in in your life concerning drugs being sold. You understand what I'm saying? You still have to come to the realization that, you know, you're in a life and death game. That's taking people's lives every day. That's destroying people's lives every day. You understand what I'm saying? That's, that's, that's strong enough to change the world. world. What I call it is, get, just got caught up in that 100-year illusion, because that's what it is. That 100-year illusion that keep on existing, that we keep thinking that somehow or another we're going to sell drugs or finance drugs or use drugs and something good is going to happen. Nothing good is ever going to happen concerning drugs for nobody. But it's that illusion that so many people keep thinking, if you get involved, something's going to change. You know what changes? What's Where that? you live, you go from that address to a maximum security prison. You go to a graveyard, or the only other option is we don't know where you go because if you get on the government wisdom protection program for becoming a snitch, nobody know where you're at. You could be standing right next to the person that became a snitch. You don't even know it because they're changing your face today and doing everything. You may recognize if they know the person where well, you might pick up their voice. But otherwise, they were standing right next to you. If they don't open their mouth, you don't even know that that is the person that may have snitched on you. So, you know, and, and, and me going, I think what may have saved my life was me going away. You know what I mean? Because I got 15 years sentenced from a conspiracy out of Boston. I've been in Boston in my life. Never, ever, I didn't really know what Boston was, to be honest with you. But I got conspiracy out of Boston. I went, I went, to, went, went to trial. It was interesting because I was sitting there, and I'm sitting there with about maybe 14 white guys, never knew none of them. So all through the trial, they're just talking about what happened. I'm sitting there looking, trying to figure out why I'm here. Then a girl comes in court and says, she, no, before she came, and they said, we called our final witness. So I said, wait a minute. This final witness got to concern me because I haven't heard my name yet. So I had an orange jacket on. I took my jacket off and sat on it. So she came into court, and the, and the district attorney was saying, we want you to give a positive identification to Pee Wee Kirkham that you said that you saw in Boston when a transaction was being made. And you know for sure that he had knowledge of that transaction because he was, they was talking to you, and he was downstairs sitting in the car. 
So she said, he, she said, yes. He said, point that person out. So she turned around and she went to point. Now, it was another brother. Uh, he was like 300 and something pounds, maybe six feet seven, right? Now, she, and then she looking for me. But guess what she was looking for? That orange jacket. That? that orange jacket. So she couldn't make a identification. And then the district attorney, he said, oh, Your Honor, she's nervous and scared to death. This is a very violent person. She's very afraid. Could we have a recess? Could we come back in 20 minutes? And I guess they said, well, after that, he took the jacket off. But in the process of the 20 minutes, I talked to the senator who was Senator Brooks. He said, Phoebe, let me say this to you. This is the biggest case ever come out of Boston. You're going to get convicted because without you, it's no case. They don't have a source. They have to make you the source. You'd be better off pleading guilty and ultimately getting Rule 35, where they reduce your sentence. Because right now, they're going to give you the max, and nothing's going to happen. It's going to stay that way. So I talked to my attorney, and, he's, and we both agreed. So I said, all right, then I pled guilty. You know, because it's obvious what she was going to do when she came back in court. And that was the first time I went away, you know. So, you know, I mean, was I in the game? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But in New York, did I make millions in the game? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? But I'm just being honest with you. And anybody else you talk to will tell you the same thing. Because if so, if not, they would have had me set up conspiracies for knowledge of. You see what I'm saying? But in this case, not only had I never been there, I had knowledge of nothing that was going on there. But, you know, I, don't have no, I didn't have a problem with that then and I don't have a problem with it now. Because as far as I'm concerned, when you get in the life of crime, you declare war against the government, the state, and every other legal entity it is, that exists. So I wasn't going to say, I remember walking out the court, and the DA said, we finally got you. I said, yeah, but you know, you know that I didn't commit this crime. You know what he said? Yeah, you're right, I know, but it's not like you had a 9 to 5. I never forgot that. And he's right. It's not like I had a 9 to 5 because I didn't, you know. But again, see, you get caught up in something that, at a young age, you either analyze it, think about it, accept it, make it your own fault, and correct it, or else you'll blame the world and complain and complain and complain, and nothing in your life ever change. I mean, it didn't take me, it didn't take me, I don't think I was away three months before I knew that nothing in the world could ever make me ever be back in the drug game under no kind of circumstances. Because, I mean, either reality hits you, it's according to who you're inside. If you're somebody, and if there's any redeeming value inside you, the government can't rehabilitate you. Rehabilitate yourself. You know what I mean? If there's any redeeming value inside you, that's what services. I mean, every time you think you could sit there in a the cell looking at a ceiling almost 24-7 before the truth either hits you that that ain't what your life should be about or the truth hits you, that you have no other life other than that. So, you know, I made it my fault and completed, oh, well, I actually got a break because what happened was I was under a non-parolable statute and Nixon changed the law. I mean, a lot, <laughs> a lot of money went into that reality. But Nixon changed this law from a non-parolable statute to a parolable statute. And everybody who was a first offender that had more than a 30 day sentence in was automatically paroled. Now, I didn't have good sense at that time. Now, I was still uh, Pee Wee Kirkland, kind of like a dangerous guy, although I was humble all my life and never had a problem, never had a problem that I created and never tried to take advantage of nobody in my entire life. Every problem I had was when people was coming to me because other people was taking advantage of them. Like a mother come to me, she said, man, P, I don't know what to say. My son owed so and so fifteen thousand dollars, and now they got a hit out on him. And I said, "Look at man." And I go to him and say, "Look at the fifteen thousand he owed. That ain't worth taking his life, man. Ain't nobody's life worth no damn fifteen thousand dollars." And I would stop things like that. And then people began to see me as a force. And once people start seeing you as a force, just like basketball, I said the statistics always tell the truth. And then. Incident after incident, incident after that happened, and the battles would surface, and I just never lost none. And I never I think it's because of me. 
I come to the realization later, you know, you can't, you never know when somebody hold a gun at your head and the gun click a couple times, don't go off. You don't know why. At that time, you think it was, it was the guy. Maybe this was the gun. No, this is a higher force than reality in life that understood at that time something you didn't understand, which is it, I, it was a greater purpose and a higher design in my life, but I didn't know that at the time. You see what I'm saying? But eventually, after incident, after incident, suicide mission, after suicide mission, you come to the realization that it's something about your life that you don't know about, you know, and that's, that's something you have to connect with. And then even when I came home, I mean, my name was so big, I mean, so big, it, it was almost bigger than the game, especially bigger than New York. I had to leave New York because that my, it's almost like, and I would tell people, yeah, when I was younger, I wouldn't leave New York to go to heaven. That's what I used to say when I was a kid. That's how much I love New York. But I had to leave New York because my name had gotten so big. And I went out west, and I ended up getting a tax case, which was basically some other foolishness. You know what I'm saying? Now what did they want to do now? Now they want to try to recover the money. So they give me a, the tax case. They never gave it to nobody in the history of the crime game other than Al Capone. It's called a net worth tax case. That's exactly what they gave me. Actually, they gave me the same 10 years they gave Al Capone, but they wasn't gonna, that wasn't the plan. And Shaw Gill, John Gotti's lawyers, my lawyers at the time, and they telling me, you're facing a 55 count indictment fee they're gonna give you every day. We gotta beat this. So I said, wait, wait till you look at discovery. When they finally got discovery, they said, we have, they have no evidence on you, people, none. They, they have you, I think he said they have you in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel spending 1,300 hours one night. You was there. That was it. You had a, some people with you. You had the dinner bill, this, that, but that's all. We don't see nothing else connected to you. Well, I kind of knew that had to be true because I would never spend money. People around me, I would always let them spend it. So there's no way they could really say somebody gave me a receipt. Tell you the truth, that night would have never existed if the silly lady at the damn desk didn't listen to me when I told her I was going to pay in cash. You know, I, you know, you give, you give them a card. Instead of waiting for me to give her cash, she rung up the card. That's how they had that bill, you know, otherwise, you know. But again, going back to that incident, nah, I don't, taxes, you know, so I'm still ready to go to jail because I still understand that what I did as a kid, you know, I never... I never like tried to live in a fantasy world and make myself believe that I'd make a mistake. I knew I made the biggest mistake a young person could make. And I knew the fact that it caused me not to play with the Chicago Bulls. I knew the fact that it it caused me to not live the life I wanted to live, to hurt everybody in my family, to hurt everybody at every alma mater, every school I went to, to hurt everybody in Harlem that people that wanted me to be, play professional basketball a thousand times more than I wanted to play professional basketball. Because for me, I was able to play in Rucker against the greatest pros in the top 15 Hall of Fame. So I had already proven myself as that premier basketball player. But to other people, they wanted me to play in the pros. So, and when, when I went away and came back, I had an opportunity then. But like I said, Larry Brown wanted me to play. He was coaching Denver Nuggets. He told me if I come, I had a no-cut contract. I had got a letter from Seattle Supersonics. You know, I was averaging 70 points in the joint, in the semi-pro league. I was averaging 70 points, and I scored 100 points in one game. And in the next game, I scored 135, which created a, a lot of national interest and recognition. And I'm getting a letter, and I ended up getting a letter from the Seattle Supersonics saying, that they want me to come there and teach the point guards what a point guard was. So I had the opportunity to, to play professional basketball again, but I just, something deep inside kept telling me, if it didn't work then, that ain't the ticket. If it didn't work then, and in the back of my mind, I was always looking, always kind of feeling that empty feeling about what would my life have been? What is my real destiny? It couldn't have been the drug game, you know, there's no such thing as a crime gene. So ain't no kid born to be a criminal. So for me to have been in the life of crime that fast, it wasn't, 
it was a choice I made for sure. But I don't know if I would have made that choice under different circumstances. But a lot of times young people don't understand, you make your choices revolving what you see and what you're around. And if you're around certain things and you're around people in the life of crime, people making money, people, in, you know, this guy over here sell, selling cocaine, the people over here selling heroin, you, these are people over here writing numbers over here, these are the guys that's the best gamblers in, in New York. Hey, I, you know, you, <laughs> if you want money, you learn how to be all that. You learn how to combine, just like playing basketball, you learn how to pass the ball, shoot the ball, dribble the ball, see the court, control the game. So I think I might have looked at the life of crime just like I looked at a basketball game in terms of in terms of processing the life of crime in my head. And 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 I always, you know, kinda understood there would be a consequence. But I just never wanted to well, I was just wanted somebody I wasn't gonna repeat something. So if I made a mistake it wasn't gonna happen. So I you know, actually, when I left Lewisburg, maximum security prison, I told the guy, I said, man, you don't come back, people, you don't come back. I said, I won't be unless it's for taxes. <laughs> and I always beat myself in the head to say that words matter. People need to realize I never try to say anything negative because words do matter, and they come back. So, you know, in I think that last case really turned it around because the second day or the last day of the second grand jury that indicted my mother. <laughs> that was crazy. And I mean, you know, I don't know if you understand what it means to kind of see the person that you love more than anybody in the world and has been telling you all your life, your potential, and things you need to do right. And all of a sudden, she's indicted now in seen as a common criminal. I don't think my mother, I never heard my mother curse. It never got high or nothing. I kind of worship my mother in a lot of ways, and that's probably why I never got high in my life. I never, I have never smoked a cigarette. I don't think I ever took an aspirin. I've never been high at all, no kind of way, but I got that from her. And then I had to hear about her being indicted, and you know, that was probably a lot worse than the 15 years, and I didn't even care about the 55 years. I just told Sarah Gill to make sure she get out the case. I mean, he went to explaining a lot of different things about, you can't do this, you, you beat the case, I'm telling you. I said, look, here, let me say this to you. You don't want to be the person telling me that you made a mistake and I get out of it and my mother's in it. Trust me, you don't want to be that person. And he just looked at me and he said, all right, and he called the DA and told him I want to plead guilty. Now, the only reason I got out of that because the DA wasn't there. The assistant DA answered the phone. And she made me, she gave me the sweetest deal you ever got in your life, 10 years. And now I know the law, so when she hung the phone up, I told her to call her back and put it on the calendar. And once she put it on a court date, you can't change it. And I was in New York. By the time I got to Vegas, he called me and said, man, they want to fire this lady. They spent three million dollars just to prosecute you. They was going to give you that 55 years and she lets you off the hook. But you know, when I look back at them things in retrospect, the fact of the matter is, if I had never had the intentions of doing the 55 years to get my mother out of it and put me in it, then I never would have got to 10 years nowhere. 